This is the one. Come on. There we go. We're live. Good morning. Good morning. We're live. Um, thank you for joining us here at uh, BET. We're here in London. We're here in Thailand. We're calling you here from Melbourne in Australia. So welcome. Uh, we are still um, waiting for one of our participants to join us. So please bear with us as we um, join up our final person. Um, Yes, this will be recorded and put somewhere where you guys can see it. Welcome from Gozo. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. My name's Sarah Marshall. I'm the head of content at BET. Um, BET is all about creating a better future by transforming education. We are a place where technology, practices, ideas, and people come together. Um, we are the biggest global education community there is, and we're really pleased to welcome you here today. What we're doing today is talking about uh, technology and uh, keeping students engaged at distance. Um, thanks to the tech, many of us are actually better connected with friends and family than before lockdown. Uh, but is that the same case for remote learners? Keeping our students actively engaged is a challenge at the best of times, but when they're studying at home or using learning packs, accessing learning is so much harder. How can we check understanding? How do we support the students who don't stay in touch? What's a good balance between live lessons and self-study? And what about students with SEND? So I've, we've brought together uh, a group of uh, experts from ar around the world, and we're still just hooking up the final person. Um, but uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and um, and tell you a little bit about themselves before we start to dive up into dive into the questions. So, um, uh, Jared, I think I'll leave it to you to start. Rock and roll. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, or wherever you're at. Um, I'm Jared. I was um, so my background. I'm a teacher originally, um, and back when I was teaching, um, that was during the decade of the brain. So everyone was talking, going brain crazy, and I was no different. So for the last 12 years, I've been studying uh, cognitive neuroscience and psychology, AI, and behavioral economics. Essentially, anything having to do with how human beings learn. And I do that all so I can bring that back to teachers and students and say, hey, here's how this works. Here's the good stuff. Here's the useless bits. The, here's the, the, the things we can use. Here's the nonsense. So I essentially consider myself a translator, and I'd love to be here with you all today, hopefully drawing a bridge between our fields. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Jules. Hello, lovely to see everybody. I'm from all over the world. Um, I'm a teacher. Um, I've been teaching for more than 20 years. Um, I'm slightly obsessed with the idea of every child um, being able to learn. So I have a big thing about access to learning and the ability to show your knowledge as well, because there's often we have a lot of children that have an awful lot of knowledge and skills, but they're somehow not getting out in the education field. So that's what I work on. Um, my day job is working in a special school. I'm head of Key Stage 3. And I'm, I'm passionate about assistive technology and have been for a long time um, working with Dorset Local Authority for a long time on getting assistive technology to our students, with particularly with dyslexia, but um, a a various special needs. So I'm very excited to be here and talk about learning today. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and next we have, um, so Mark's still not with us, I'm afraid, but Phil, uh, over to you. Okay, great to see you all, or actually see your comments in the section over there as I'm not seeing you. Um, I'm a special education teacher, and right now I'm currently based in Bangkok, Thailand, at International School Bangkok. Uh, my focus has always been on improving student agency and motivation, which I think is very fitting for what we're doing today. I like to do that specifically through setting up classes that are personalized and structured around one-to-one -one learning and are measured and ambitious and research-based as well. Fantastic. Um, just a, a quick point of reference. There is, uh, there are questions. Please feel free to add questions, um, guests, um, on on the right hand side. We will do our best to answer them. If there's something that you like, please, that you're particularly interested in, then we will like it, and then it will come sort of come up the, come up the, um, come up the thread in your answer. We will. Um, we will email out video. You'll be able to access it afterwards. Yes, certainly, and we will pass out Twitter handles. Um, but first of all, I think uh, we'd just like to start with the question uh, to Jared. Um, what do we mean by engagement? 
Can so you this talk is to us a, sort of start with the science. Yeah, please? I love it. So we uh, engagement's like one of those big umbrella terms that covers so much stuff so that you can have 10 people talking about it and they're talking about different things. So I think a good standard to set for engagement, the way we talk about it in the lab is it comes in kind of three dimensions when, when we're talking about engagement for learning. You have the cognitive dimension, you've got the emotional dimension, and you've got the behavioral dimension. So cognitive says, what are you thinking about generally and specifically? Are you engaged with a task up here? Emotionally, are you engaged with the task through here? And behaviorally, are, are you actually enacting physically those tasks as you need to? So only when we typically say, if you lose one of those three aspects, the entirety of engagement falls apart. So it's not just enough to, tar to target one, you've got to hit all three. And I think an interesting thing, which Mark will talk more about here in a second, is a precursor to even that then is what we'll call um, aspirations or goals. If a kid doesn't want to do something, if a kid has no deeper reason to engage with something, all the cognitive, emotional, behavioral stuff in the world goes right out the window. So it starts with that aspiration. And once you've got that, the door is open and we can start considering these three different angles. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, and Mark, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, do you want to just introduce yourself just for, for a couple of moments and then we'll sort of move on. Um, we'll move on with the discussion. Apologies for being late for the meeting, um, but um, you know, that, that's part of the course for me anyway. Um, I, uh, I, my name is Mark Emerson. I'm um, um, a Chief Executive of the City of London Academies Trust. We run um, soon to be 10 schools in London, primary, secondary and sixth form. And um, I'm also a national behaviour advisor and I've been a head in two other uh, outstanding, or three actually outstanding uh, secondary schools in, in London. So that's my background. <clears throat> um, yeah, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, uh, the engagement side of this. Uh, I've been a, one of the national behaviour advisors. Um, and how we actually reach disadvantaged communities, because I think there's one of the things that we've been talking about um, is is that engagement with whatever is out there. There's the physical side of actually being able to log on, which I, I eventually have been able to do today. Uh, but actually, there's also that uh, commitment to learning. And just one thing, just to throw in right at the start, I've, I've been uh, within our group, we've got some independent schools. And the independent schools are doing online learning at the moment and they've got better attendance and engagement on those in those classes than they've had uh during the year whereas in the state schools in disadvantaged areas with lots of children um you know free school meals and uh, state support um we're looking at engagement rates of 50 percent or below and so we've got a huge disparity not just in the technical side but the uh, impetus to engage with whatever's online, which is a real difficult problem with this this sort of uh, media. Absolutely, and and that's a that's a webinar or or that's a discussion and and, and a very serious discussion in its in its own right. Um, yeah. Which I think, as bet, we will certainly keep returning to. Um, thinking of what uh, Jared said at at the beginning. Um, it would be great to have from from each of you um, a couple of wins. What's been what's been working well um, during this last during these last few weeks of uh, in this extraordinary situation? What's worked, and perhaps what's not, but particularly what's what can uh, visitors take away or, and and um, and pr put into their own settings? Well, I, I think one to one sessions really shine in this format. I believe in one-to-one -one sessions in physical classrooms as well, but here online, we really are encouraged to go to that one-to-one -one because we are really targeting the emotional and behavioral side that we were talking about. And if we don't have that, we're not gonna get to the cognitive side. So I think by having the one-to-one -one sessions, we're able to really listen to the students. And I think by listening, we can target what matters most for them and is meaningful for them. And, and what I would suggest if you are doing these one-to-one -one sessions is make them very targeted so that ahead of time, the students know what that conversation is gonna be about, they know what the goals are, but they then lead that conversation and you're able to help guide them to that goal. Um, I can talk more about this, but I think that's a quick um, win right there. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I would say that um, one of the key things in terms of the the uh, arrangements around learning to to facilitate engagement are to establish um, very clear routines. Um, and if you're providing online learning, um, you, you know, some of our schools, for example, are following the school timetable. Um, and they're saying, right, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to follow the school, school timetable. We're going to run the lessons interactively, perhaps shorter with, um, you know, some interaction and then some online learning uh, as a follow-up. But they're, they're following the timetable. I think in homes, having a routine where children get up, they get dressed, they, they start the day at the same time, and they finish the day at the same time, it's, it's very helpful. And I think one of the things uh, that we've talked about before is the uh, the need to um, maybe limit the platforms, um, you know, and the um, so that actually we 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 are using appropriate platforms. So we want interactive lessons. We use the interactive platforms, um, you know, Google Meet or Zoom or whatever that that particular platform is. And if we want to do some whole school things, which we occasionally do, we want to put some messages out to the whole school. Maybe that that's best through a platform like um like uh, a youtube channel but however however we do it we need to limit it so actually the uh, the ability for the children to get on and to it becomes sort of a less of an issue and the uh, the different methodologies aren't an impediment to the learning so those are just a couple of really clear simple you know self-evident i would have thought um tips on in terms of engagement um, I, yeah, I, I agree with all of those points from, from everybody. And what's interesting for me is this is not any different to in schools with regards to special needs. Um, so, for instance, pre-learning information before you before you teach it is excellent. So pre-learning vocabulary, for instance, is a brilliant way of, um, of getting learning in and engaging students. Um, targeted and one-to-one -one sessions are really useful and routine as we've talked about is really useful um, the one thing i would add i think particularly for um, children with semh or um, special needs is that a connection with the teacher may be far more important than some other children so some other children this they're easy learners you know they find learning easy so that this for them will not be as hard but actually for a lot of our students just getting that connection first even if it's a phone call um, and having a chat, seeing how they are, that's really important. And once you've got that, then you can move into learning and looking at routines and, and lessons. Um, and this synchronistic learning, I think, you know, from, from using the timetable that Mark was talking about, I think works for some children, but I don't think it works for others. And it may be partly to do with family. You know, if they've got a big family and they're sharing laptops, um, it's very difficult. Um, I have one daughter that's working at sort of night time, <laughs> not doing a lot, you know, doing a lot less in the morning. So, so it's not, it's never one size fits all. And I think, to be honest, this technology that we're talking about is a very similar to actually to um, being at schools with regards to learning. Yeah, and I'll um. So it, I think what's good is we've we've gotten some good emotional, behavioral, functional um, issues. So I guess probably I'll talk. I'll tackle the the cognitive then. So for some cheap and easy wins on the cognitive side, um, you kind of cognitive breaks down into two regions, what we're going to call specific. Can a child, can a brain actually process information in this way? And then general. So when it comes to, to kind of specific, one of the easiest things is when you recognize, okay, text and speech don't work. So here's just an easy one. Human beings cannot read words while listening to somebody speak at the same time. And the reason it's a hardware issue, the brain processes your silent reading voice in the same way it does an out loud speaking voice. So if you're running an online session and you've got slides with text or you've got PDFs that they're looking through while you're teaching them, no one's learning anything because that, that, that is a bottleneck that the brain can't handle. So how are we using this technology when we take a look at specific cognitive rules about how the brain works? Um, making sure we're, we're adhering to those, multitasking, um, reading all these other things. So, and then I think on the other side, then general is, is essentially, are my kids ready for this and are we focused in the right spot? So a, a, a good rule of thumb is, and this is gonna sound totally simple, but we only form memories for those things we think about, um, or as Willingham used to put it, memory is the residue of thought. 
Now, online, we have a big enjoyment factor where a lot of people with digital tools want to keep people doing it longer. The measure of engagement is how long did you do it? Frankly, it doesn't matter how long you did anything. If you're thinking about the wrong stuff, you could be doing it for 10 hours and you're not going to learn the things I need you to learn. So I need your thinking focused on this one good bit. So a good, uh, just a good example of this kind of put in action is if you take a look at Duolingo, that language learning app, um, on average, people use that anywhere from 12 to 20 minutes a day more than any other language learning la app. But people learn no more than any other language learning app. So essentially, they're wasting 20 minutes a day. And when you ask them why they do it so much longer, it's because they love the bells and the whistles, and they want to get a star, and they want to get a gold coin, and they want to beat their friends, and they want to get a new outfit for that little birdie thing. That's all <laughs> keeping me engaged. You know, thinking about, about this. <laughs> that is, I know that was I tried to learn Italian I failed yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was keeping them engaged but they're thinking about the wrong thing so at the end of the day they're not pulling out the information you want them to so <clears> where <throat> is the actual thinking going with the lessons we're delivering that um, Jared go on go on go on sorry yeah. I'd like to jump in because I think that's brilliant and I think it's a nice segue into really measuring our lessons and feeding forward into future lessons. Um, because I think it's important that we understand what students are getting from this, especially since we're in uncharted territories now. This is different than what we've done before. We've been you know, masters of our craft in a traditional classroom, not in this venue. So what I do daily is I do a final thoughts protocol that takes one to two minutes at the end of every session, and it incorporates two different things. One is, quick and easy quantitative feedback. So it's a scale one through 10. How much do you feel like you learned in today's lesson? That's it. And then there is the option for qualitative feedback. And the way I structure it is they can answer one of five questions and they could be questions such as, what did you learn today? What are you proud of? What are you gonna start doing differently? Is there something you wanted to share with me today but didn't get a chance to? Is there a way we could further improve this class? Um, and then students decide which one they want to answer so that you get also an idea of what question was most important to them as well as the responses. Um, now you could force them to answer one question, right? What did they get out of today's lesson? Um, so that's up to you. But I do think it's very, very important that we are getting data on a constant basis and reworking our classes to be more effective both now and for the future if we need this. Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of doing some uh, assessment for learning so we know where children are, which would, would be what we would be doing face to face is vitally important. And I think the, the aspects that you're talking about, uh, about engagement, it's not just about switching on, is it? It's about, how much they're, they're, they're concentrating on what's being said, um, how much children are being able to, um, to to learn through this process, how we're ensuring that, that the, the key parts of the lesson or the learning is imparted and they actually understand that and can go away and work with it. Um, that's the critical thing about it. Now, and I think the difficulty with, it, with online learning is you, within a classroom, and I think all great teachers can do this, you can look in the eyes and you can see whether they're dead behind the eyes, whether they're drifting off and all those other things. And if you're teaching a large class, which is different to one-to-one, -to -one, you might have um, up to 30 children um, uh, logged in uh, and you might have been able to mute them, which is a great button, which I wish I had in the classroom. Um, but the but you don't necessarily, uh, you might see their, their names, but you won't necessarily see their faces. And can you see what's behind their eyes i mean you know i'm looking at you you for now and i'm can i see whether you're really taking any notice uh, i hope you are but i don't know really um <laughs> so it's, it's yeah. about that, that that interaction i don't think you can beat it so I, I think as we move forward there's a lot of lessons we're learning um you know in the last 20 years we've been trying to do this sort of stuff and actually the the great people out there are taking the real learning points from the sort of experiments we're running every day in our classrooms and they're going to frame a more um, uh, a sort of higher level approach to the use of online learning in the future but blending it 
with that online, with that sort of face-to-face -face and potentially offline lending as well. So I think we, if we play this right, I mean, although it's a terrible thing we're in, um, in terms of the COVID outbreak, we can take some real positives and accelerate our approaches to online learning. And I'll just take one example of this. We're looking at um, uh, providing a middle leader training. And initially we think that's gonna be face to face next year across all of our 10 schools. Um, and we, we're working with a partner, which is uh, Institute of Education. The Institute of Education in London are saying they're not gonna do any face to face um sessions seminars training right the way through at least until january and potentially all the way through the year that has then forced us to reconsider what we're going to do with our staff how we're going to make it interactive how we might have some blended learning where we do some small groups with our teachers and how we'll take the advantages and what we've learned this in this period to do something great but the other really good thing about it is they're saying well the access to the really key educational thinkers who are based at the Institute of Education, we may not normally have been able to get into our sessions, but actually using an online platform, if we're creative, we can get maybe some of the key thinkers um, in educational uh, thought theory into our sessions for our middle leaders. So there are opportunities opening up that we need to sort of curate and plan for in the future. Um, if, if I may, there's a there's a question on the chat about um, adult um, engagement. Um, if, if I can bring if I can bring that in now, it, it feels appropriate. Um, it's from Andrea Naleto, so thank you for this. And the question is: Is the evidence on student engagement also applicable to remote learning for adults? And I guess we can talk about that for our our um, teachers and our middle leaders, but also for um, for um, people re-engaging the learning in later life and further education colleges. Um, who would like to take that? Do you want me to, I'll, I'll Fabulous, chime in. Thank you, great. From a learning angle, um, absolutely. You can assume learning is a, a very, is a very unique game from birth to about six, but once you pass the age of six, the rules don't change. It doesn't matter if you're 11, it doesn't matter if you're 111. So once you learn the principles of learning, and especially when it comes to learning on technology, you can assume the exact same learning cognitive issues are gonna be the same. Um, the only thing that's gonna differ, so this is where, where you kind of think about, okay, how am I organizing my, my lessons? How am I organizing my presentations of material? That doesn't really necessarily need to change. The one thing that's gonna change is even though we don't have things called digital natives, kids tend to spend a lot more time on computers than adults. And so what this ends up doing is, is bear with me, this is gonna take one minute, but it'll make sense in the end. Teenagers last year spent an average of 2,100 hours each. That's essentially equivalent to 93 days on a computer doing things like playing video games, watching movies, listening to things, social media, all that fun stuff. Wow. They spent a grand total of 200 hours each learning on a computer. So that's 91% flitting, 9% learning, which means when you sit a teenager down or a student down to learn on a computer, their natural inclination, their story is going to be to say, oh, a computer, let's start having fun. And that usually they last about six minutes when they're doing homework, 15 minutes in a lesson like this before they start multitasking and opening tabs. Adults, you don't have, you have a little bit more time because we haven't trained ourselves 2000 hours a year playing this machine to just have fun. Whenever I sit at this machine, my mind goes right to work. I spend 2000 a year working. So as soon as I sit down to learn, I'm in a much better spot to sustain my attention longer. So adults, you can assume you're gonna have a nice longer period of time with them than kids. But when it comes to the actual learning and, and content and cognitive issues, they're gonna be exactly the same. Mm. I think also just to say that the, the, there's a, I'm an adult learner, so I, I didn't start university till I was 23. I left school with no qualifications whatsoever. Um, but um, so there's a bit more of a mot motivation, I think, around adults learning as well. Um, I wanted to add in there, though, that the simplicity, which um, you've been talking about, really, that because children flit and they've got butterfly minds, um, I have to. Um, and um, but the simplicity of just being able to use um, a word processor, you know, just being able to type your exams, for instance, rather than write them. Um, that was huge for me. And it is for a lot of our students with dyslexia. So 
being able to use predictive text, being able to use text to speech. And they're actually really simple things that most of our students, even those that don't have um, access to too much technology, there's always accessibility areas um, that people can access. And actually this is a time for adults and children to be learning about finding those accessibility, like in Office 365, for instance, the immersive reader, or just looking at your predictive text. They're the things that can really help some of our learners that are less engaged and motivated. And so I wanted to get that in there because I think for adult learners, particularly those that have failed before, like me, um, those simple things really helped. Yeah. That's great. Um, if I may, uh, we've got so many questions coming through. I'd like to jump into a few more, if, if that's OK. Um, and, and the next one is about uh, a learner attention span. I think it really builds on what you were what you, you, you've been speaking of here. So and it may differ at different um, different ages, but uh, different ages. But the question is, um, the evidence doesn't seem to be consistent. Sort of how long is a how long is a learner's attention span? And what are the, where are the I suppose are the, the differentials where how does it change for a student with dyslexia perhaps or a student with um depending on their setting or age yep. just a, just a small one there <laughs> no do you want I, I'll, let me start with the baseline so you can assume yeah. baseline so we're not talking um students with adhd or anything at this point um you can assume baseline so the data coming out of hong kong after 13 weeks of this stuff is is during live lessons like this, 15 minutes seems to be the window before about half the kids start to shut down. But it's easy to play with. All you have to, all that means is you don't have to teach everything in 15 minutes. You just have to find something to do every 15 minutes that changes their perspective, that changes their thinking, and it resets their attention. And you've bought yourself another 15 minutes. So it's anything as simple as okay, I want you to just type in a question. Um, play a little game. Here's a little video clip. Here's a joke. Anything to just change the context to reset them, you can buy yourself another 15. So with that said, um, I think there's there's a lot of research that says kids only have like a one minute attention span. It's, it's all nonsense. Our attention span hasn't changed, it never will change. It's just when we use a tool, that tool dictates what type of attention you need to use. When you read a book, it dictates you need long-term attention. Watch when kids have it. When you sit down in a two hour movie, watch when kids do just fine watching Thor. It's when you sit down at a computer, they're so used to YouTube and all these other things, giving them only one minute hits that they just assume that's what they're supposed to be doing. So you've just got to kind of work with them and make sure you're hitting them at those 15 minute intervals to keep them alive with you. Um, something to add on to that, I think that is practically useful. Um, and I've seen more, more questions about how do we make the one to one happen when it doesn't seem like it fits and helps address this issue is be creative about how we structure our classes. Is it possible to have two teachers and two classrooms together and then have one teacher doing one-to-ones in breakout rooms? And they're rolling through these five-minute uh, one-to-ones. They're refreshing and refocusing these students. We're getting to hear from the students what they think about the lesson as it's going on and what's important um, moving forward. So I think we, we also want to be creative about how we're structuring our classes so that we can take advantage of, of these attention issues. But I would say that the, the, the principles, you know, the, for online learning are the same as in class learning. You know, um, 15 minutes uh, in a learning environment is exactly the sort of attention span you'd be thinking about before you moved on to another activity or you wanted to change things up or at least check the learning to to interrupt things unless they're engaged on a you know an exam or something like that or an exam practice um, so I think there is um, you know there are lots of parallels and I think we you know there, there's the engagement there's the environment there's the access uh, to to ICT, I think access access to ICT nowadays is uh, much less of a problem. I think it's the engagement with it we were talking about. But actually, on you know we can set the environment. But the other key point is the content, the quality of the content, and you know the the idea that you can um, generate better attention spans with more creative and engaging content is, I think. You know, self self evident as well. I, I talk about a lot of self evidence things. I leave the research to Jared. But the um, but the but the important thing is that actually, 
we need to not be delivering in the same way. We need to be changing it up. We need to use other devices if possible. And we need to supplement it with, you know, like I've said before, a blended approach to learning, which you would ideally be using in your um, mainstream classroom anyway, if that's how you were, uh, that's what good teachers do. So good teachers online are probably the same as good teachers in the classroom. Um, they are people who do understand the attention spans, they are changing the activities up, they are checking the learning, and they are looking for student, um, um, I suppose, independence in thought to feed back into the loop and also to understand from them what is working, what isn't. So I think those are core principles in terms of content that we need to get right. I would say as well, it's just you say about um, good teachers are good teachers online learning and or in the classroom. It's the same with um, SEN teaching, you know, good yeah. SEN teaching is going to be the same now as it ever has been. Um, one of the things to say though around ADHD, for instance, so attention deficit, is that um, that attention may be even more difficult. And some of the tips that I can give teachers is that um, children with ADHD will get very overwhelmed very quickly. So they need distraction-free screens. They need distraction-free areas. So even if they live in a very busy household in a small room, if they can just have a little workstation and um, to encourage parents and carers to clear that area so they've just got their laptop. But also as teachers, when we're presenting our information, it has to be as distraction-free as possible. So borders around um, activities, using very simple icons that are repetitive and continuous. Those types of things will really help a child with ADHD, um, but also all of your children. It's this is the set, you know, it's good teaching. Um, yeah. And just one more thing to say on ADHD is that they can often hyper focus as well. So we think about them being butterfly minds and flitting, but once they're in something, they can hyper focus and that the house can literally burn down around them and they won't notice. So if you can get them in the zone of hyper focus, actually, that's a really good. Um, Way, way to be as long as it's on the right thing. And just to say, I love Dara's idea of this 15 minute, um, where every 15 minutes you ask them to type in a question or to do that. Um, it's something that I it completely resonates with me and I will do, be doing that far more having heard that. Amazing, thank you. Um, may I take you back to structure? Um, we've talked about structuring the lesson time, but uh, there's a, quite a few questions coming through about uh, sort of going back to the one-to-one -one question, which we, well, the one-to-one -one point, which we made quite early on. And that is, f for many, it's it's impractical to have, have a one-to-one -one situation, particularly in the uh, state sector. And so what would your collective advice be on a, um, what's the optimum class size in this environment if one-to-one's not possible and, and sort of bu built on that if uh a question of breakouts how how do you how can you practically make uh, sort of breakout situations work um well from my point of view I, i've seen um my own children doing a, an online drama class which is a, you know a live drama class through a, 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 an interactive platform zoom and um, uh, they are, uh, I could hear some shouting downstairs and uh, I immediately thought there was a problem. So I went rushing down and he actually just, he's acting. So, you know, that's what he was doing. And he'd been, he'd been asked to present something. So I think the, the, um, the way in which that was managed was that there were about 30 children, uh, but they were set something to um, practice on their own. And then they had to uh, each present back to the rest of the group. Um, and I thought that was a, you know, a really creative way of doing it. And I, and I said the mute button worked really well in that arrangement because obviously they weren't talking over each other. Everybody was able to listen to that particular person uh, when they were when they were uh, gone and rehearsed something and were bringing it back. And I think those sorts of techniques that people are going to be much more adept at after this period are things we need to be considering. Uh, and there, there will be hundreds of um, methodologies which, we, uh, which will be personal to individual teachers that we need to get out there and share uh, when we're back together and potentially in these sorts of forums. But ideally, I would like in my groups to be about 15 so you can see and get round everybody 
um, in, in the uh, in the learning environment. So I think in a mainstream classroom, you're looking at 15 as the optimum. Ultimately, you may have to go more than that. And um, like I said, once you get into the hundreds, you have to be using a delivery mechanism, which is different, which is maybe delivery through a, a YouTube um, a channel or something similar, and then potentially follow up through individual one-to-ones, uh, which might just be phone calls to, to assess uh, and to find out what the reaction is. So it is a bit more cumbersome in some areas and you can't do everything that you would normally do in a school setting. It, it, it's um, certainly, I'm, I'm really um, uh, absolutely with the, the view that uh, for special needs, for one-to-one, -one, for small groups, it is probably um, you know, a, a vehicle that we could use a lot more often. And actually, for children who are excluded from school, or suspended from school. We've been talking about getting proper work out to these children for, for years and not really doing it very effectively. And this could be a real vehicle for children who can't come to school for medical reasons, or children excluded or for special needs children. And as we've said, uh, as the, the panel said, um, you know, good special needs teaching is good online special needs teaching. And I would say good teaching is good special needs teaching and good special needs teaching is good teaching anyway. So if we can all just accept that and get the content right, get the delivery right, we've got opportunities to do things we've never been able to do effectively before. Brilliant. Phil, do you want to jump in here? No, I mean, okay. I agree, absolutely. I would say one thing is, when we say one-to-one, -one, it doesn't mean you have to have a one-to-one -one session every single class period. It means that you're doing this in a consistent way. If you're going through a semester online or you're going through a month online and you're not having a one-to-one -one session with the student, I would argue something's wrong. I think there needs to be consistent one-to-one -one on some level. How often you do that might be limited based on the structure you're working within. And that's why I advocate for maybe having some combined classes when possible or someone supporting so that these one-to-ones are happening on a rolling basis. I don't believe it can happen every day in most settings. Ideally, I'm fortunate enough I get to have that every day and it's beautiful, but we want that to happen as often as possible because that's where the students have their voice, they have their choice, and we actually are actively monitoring and changing our instruction to make sure we have quality content we were talking about. Now, I'd like to uh, say the same, uh, agree with you, and, and that's sort of what I would say about the one-to-one -one is it's the connection first. Um, the one-to-one -one is important to get these the children that we haven't heard much from, um, you know, because there are children, particularly, in, you know, in the state sector that we are not hearing from. And, and, you know, it's really important to call them, give them a mentor, give them a connection, give them a classroom buddy um, that may be finding it easier than them and connecting them. And that's one-to-one -one is really important at first then they might be able to access other lessons. Um, but it, but that, that for me is, is the one-to-one. -one. And, and I know schools um, are doing, they've got TAs involved in this too. So, you know, they, they can access a larger class from the teacher, um, which is more um, a whole class. And then they can come back in to speak to their teaching assistants and run through it with them in a one-to-one. -one. There's some really lovely um, examples across the country that, that people are doing. And, and that's where we need to learn. We need to learn from that. I do think, as Mark said right at the beginning, that private schools have been doing this for longer and they, they've got better structures set up and we are, we are behind in the state sector and we need to catch up and learn from that. But we also have very different contexts often. And that, like I say, just, just ensuring that we speak to every child in our school every week is quite a challenge. Yeah, very, very much so. I'd say that that's one of the other things which goes back to the environment and the parental support <clears throat> the, the the independent schools i've spoken to you know they are paying for this and they've got a, a huge impetus for their, their their children feel that that they have to be online they have to be uh, be being taught and also this the schools have to provide something which is value for money and they're saying that if they don't they're going to have to start uh, reducing their fees in the state sector in the, which are where i've always worked uh, we've got a, you know large numbers of children who are on um, um, uh, pupil premium, large number of special needs children, large numbers of ex access problems. Um, you know, seventy percent of the children are from disadvantaged homes. 
um, and we are just not getting the, the the engagement, not even the physical engagement, the technical engagement that we want. And then, uh, as you've said, following them up with phone calls is huge, hugely onerous to try and get those children to engage with the learning. And although the government is looking currently at uh, rolling out more internet access in, uh, and um, more machinery into uh, uh, laptops for, for this type of child, the, uh, the, the issue is not that. The issue is around the culture and value placed on education. Where value is high in education, there's more engagement. Where value is low on education, there is less engagement. And we've got a bigger, I mean, I, I hope, that what this has done has has woken pe people up to that fundamental cultural issue, which is uh, it's certainly a play in our country and potentially in in other um, in industrialized countries, where there is a big gap and a growing gap between those who engage and those who don't engage. Do you want to hear something weird? I was just thinking this while you were talking. Um, about this idea of where are you placing your your premium? What is society saying is important and how that's driving how we all interact? Um, guess what the biggest predictor is of tertiary attendance and success amongst students? It has nothing to do with IQ, has nothing to do with where you went to school, has nothing to do with SES. Those are all kind of mildly there. The biggest predictor is how many books are in your household the day you were born. Yeah. And the idea being is exactly this, is if you are in a house where there's a ton of books, you can assume that those parents put a premium on education. You can assume that kid's going to be the one that's going to be pushed forward. So we see this power of the parents to put a premium to say education is important and we see the impact it has on kids. So kind of like what you were saying is how do we pull that to the broader yeah. social network? So it's not just a house, it's all of us put that premium on it so everyone can step back up. Absolutely. And, and it's, a, it's a double edged sword that because I think that that's where technology is can be, you know, I'm, I, again, I was from a household with not many books and um, uh, technology for me was one of the things that that um, helped, you know, I read, but um, being able to access things, you know, be, that I couldn't through my community. Um, this is it, you can access amazing lectures now, you can access people, but it is that engagement, you've got to want to do it. I didn't want to do it till I was 23, you know. So um, I think it's finding that engagement and that motivation that's really, really vital um, for, for our children. And um, so I, yeah, I agree with the panel. Um, and that's across the world, isn't it? You know, and, and um, giving them the access to be able to do that and, and the confidence to engage. And, and, and I think that's where um, often the good teaching comes as well from sort of context and also relevance. So what's, it might be more important for some children to what's relevant for me and why is this relevant? And, and, and that's where those um, linking education and learning to things that are relevant and that are of interest to them does help. I mean, we can't always uh, do that, but um, but where possible, I think that's a really important um, way of engaging some of our learners. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we, we are getting short of time, but um, I've got a couple more questions that have um, bumped very high up the list with a lot of um, a lot of people would like to hear from you on. Uh, and the first one of those is, can you suggest any tips to increase increase engagement in asynchronous learning activities in situations where connectivity issues are are there um, for the students and the teachers, perhaps? Um, so, so perhaps a, a, a few pointers on on that from you. One one thing I would say, and this is a bigger thing that I think is specifically applicable to this, is reduce the workload and in addition to reducing the workload prioritize what the goals are what is the must get goal from this what are some secondary goals and then this is extra again this is applicable anytime anywhere but i think especially with asynchronous if we don't know what's going on in this student's world we want to make sure they can at least get to the core nugget if possible and make that as easy and explicit as we can yeah i, and I would I say, would say oh, yeah, sorry, sorry mark go ahead yeah i would say that um the 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 important thing is where the asynchronous work works with the synchronous work and what 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 we do to provide impetus 
to then go and do something which may be in the child's own time or, or whatever. And, um, you know, if we can generate that engagement, that uh, interest, um, and that potential uh, creative approach, then we can usually generate some um, some impetus to go and do go and do work which is uh, potentially of their own uh, on their own without any particular support. And I do think that that's um, certainly the, the way we need to see it because I think the the, the other advantage of doing um, sort of online learning like this <clears throat> is we've got to be really um, conscious of cognitive overload and potentially teachers if they are um, going to provide you know impetus work it has to be really clear really focused it has to be short sharp without um, too much verbosity and then the, the children need to be expected to go and do the work that they, they've been set and then there needs to be follow-up so it's the whole uh, process should be refined uh, towards what the, the great teachers do, again, what the great teachers do in the classroom. They keep it simple, they keep it succinct, and then they get the children to go and work. But it's all part of a, a continuous um, understanding of how the plan of work is going to unfold, and it makes sense to the learner, and it makes sense in terms of the learning environment. I completely agree with both um, uh, both of you, particularly that I love the idea of the um, the core nugget, what's the core nugget that they want to do. And I would say that if you've got, if there are, again, I'm talking about those pupils that are hard to engage, um, yeah. if they've done nothing so far, then just one thing, <laughs> you know, yeah. this, right, this is one thing, and then the next, and then the next, because um, actually we've got this sort of rush of online, um, I mean, there's so much online. I keep saying to my kids, you know, oh, you can go to Oak, you can go to here, but actually it's too overwhelming. They need to hear one message, um, a small nugget, this is what you need to do today, uh, this is what I want from you, and then build from there. And those children that aren't engaged, I think that's where, um, I do think schools, teachers, teaching assistants can really help families at home that are struggling with children not engaging um, by just having that chat with, with the child, you know, what, what is it, what, what, what is the issue? Because, you know, kids, once they know somebody's invested in them, they will work with them. Um, so it's it's in, ensuring that there's investment in those children and that we're giving them those small core concepts. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of other maybe tips for people, um, and parents and teachers alike, that for those children that are really have lost confidence in education, and, and this goes before this crisis, but um, there's, there's something that I've um, been working with schools a lot on, and it's called errorless learning, which is the idea that they only do things that they can do well. So for instance, if they can um, add or multiply to a certain point, they only do that for a while until they gain their confidence. Because these children, in times of anxiety, they don't risk take like they used to. So actually doing something that's more challenging and more difficult that they might have done in a trusted environment within the school, um, suddenly they're risk taking, they become risk averse because they're anxious. Um, and so giving them errorless learning, giving them things that they feel really confident with and they really enjoy, um, but and we know that they're doing them right, is a good starting place. And then slowly upping the risk, but in a very managed way. So I think that would be one good thing. And also learning to draw. Um, drawing helps the memory, absolutely. And doing things like dual coding for teachers, but also getting your children to draw things out. So saying, you know, oh, a maths problem, a history, anything, you know, just draw that out for me. Uh, see how that works for you. Explain it through a drawing. There are wonderful ways to keep the memory going and engagement. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I think we're, we're coming to the end of our time now. Um, and I just wondered if you would, if uh, the panel would have any sort of final comments, final sort of two to three top tips, you know, must do's that can help our educators in this extraordinary situation. Um, uh, Jared, do you want to start? <laughs> Sure, sure. I did. You know how to teach. Don't think that the computer is going to change anything. I think Mark is right on that. Good teaching is good teaching is good teaching. Yeah. You keep doing what you do. Um, and then kind of piggybacking off of what Jules was saying earlier, um, if aspirations, if goals, if intrinsic motivation is the starting point, then yeah, for, especially for the asynchronous synchronous learning stuff, 
how you lead into everything is going to be all important. Can you hook kids in? Can you get them to go, wait, I want an answer. And you say, the only answer is going to come from the work you're about to do. How are you building that initial aspiration that then leads into all these things we've been discussing? So I think that's a, a cool point she was talking about. Great. Uh, Jules, do you want to go next? Um, yeah, I mean, my um, my tips are always the same for the inclusive classroom, and I think that my tips are the same for inclusive online learning. Um, so uh, visuals, always use visuals to prop up any um, anything. Draw to aid your working memory. Um, think about removing barriers for our children with special needs. What are the barriers and get rid of them. Um, repetition, repetition, repetition for those children. Um, and also carry a language. Um, I'm a very chatty person, but as an SEN teacher, um, I've learned that through carrier language, that's the language that we kind of carry our subjects in. Try to keep that simple, try to keep it concise so that your subject comes to the fore. So don't um, use too many words, basically, <laughs> which I do all the time. <laughs> Mark? Yeah, I struggle with that as well. Um, <laughs> the, um, I do think, though, that that's a key point. I think that um, online learning, we need to make sure that the messages are succinct, concise, um, and we need to make sure that they're linked to off-grid learning. Um, and there is a clear flow to what they're doing, which actually everybody can understand. I think going back to the the, um, the first couple of points, uh, having um, a limited number of platforms or, or potentially one platform which is used with supplementing with apps and little tricks and things to make it interesting. Um, and I think the other thing is to just make sure that the routines are in place and that you know potentially the, there's, there is a timetable. It may not be the exact replication of the school timetable. One of the schools uh, is saying that when they're doing interactive learning, the lessons are reduced from, um, from 50 minutes to 35 minutes um, with bigger gaps in between. Um, and I think ultimately we need to have um, personal contact, whether that is through one-to-one -one online or phone calls or potentially uh, having the children to school for, for seminars and tutorials. Uh, you know, during this period, I think that is critical. And I think we might have to sacrifice um, achieving a progress for more just basic contact. Mm. Agreed. Okay. Um, I, I, I love that, Mark. And picking back on the personal, my final words would be listen to our students. I think it's so important we listen, especially when we do those one-to-ones. It's easy for us to talk. Let's hear what they have to say. Um, and alongside that, Let's continuously gather feedback so that we're feeding forward, especially since this is a new time for us. And then finally, as many of us have said, let's reduce platforms, let's reduce workload, and let's really clarify what matters most. Yeah. Fantastic. I would like to thank you all for your time today. It's been such an interesting discussion. And I'd also like to thank everybody who's been uh, participating online. We're a global group of uh, speakers here, but actually it's an extreme, it's a totally global audience with people from uh, the Middle East, from Australia, from New Zealand, from 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 everywhere. It's, it, it's, it's wonderful to, to have you with us and we're very grateful. Um, we will follow up with uh, further links and information. We'd love your feedback. Please let us know what you think of today's session and uh, join us again. We have uh, another session at the beginning of June, which will be all about well-being and remote learning. So we hope you'll be able to join us then. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Very much. Bye. Thank you so Bye, everybody. Much. See you soon. So I just need to turn us off, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs>